welcome to the Friday, January 22nd, 2021 edition of the Clemson Dubcast. Hope everyone out there is doing well. The bumper music that you're listening to that has been a part of this since the very beginning from the City Champs. Great band out of Memphis. Drummer, a friend of mine, George Sluppick. They actually have a new album coming out, I believe in March. But for the meantime, check them out on Spotify, whatever. They're on they two really good albums they made way back in the day. Constantly a part of my rotation. Clemson basketball team trying to turn things around. A tough turnaround down in Tallahassee against Florida State. Got a column up on TigerIllustrated.com right now trying to assess how they get their old mojo back. Their pre-COVID pause mojo back. Boy, that's a mouthful. Title sponsor of the Dubcast since the very beginning back in August of 2018. Parm Smith and Archenhold Law Firm in downtown Greenville. They want you to know that their office remains open and available to serve you during the COVID-19 crisis. They are also offering their clients the ability to meet via telephone or through video conferencing. Whether you have a loved one who has suffered from a car accident, defective product, a neglectful nursing home facility, or medical malpractice issue, Parm Smith and Archenhold's Greenville lawyers can provide the protection and guidance you need. Free consultations 864-990-4581 or on the web at parhamlaw.com. That's P-A-R-H-A-M law.com. College football season is over, but NFL season is still grilling season. And Jack Oliver's Pool, Spa, and Patio is South Carolina's premier source for the big three names in grills, Weber, Traeger, and my favorite, the Big Green Egg. Make the most of your stay-at-home tailgate party with a premium gas charcoal or pellet grill from Jack Oliver's. Their 10,000-square-foot showroom offers a huge selection of grills, patio furniture, and hot tubs and saunas. Shop in the store or buy online at Jack Oliver's Pool Spa and Patio, 3303 Forest Drive in Columbia, and jackoliverpools.com. If you're in the Eastern Midlands and PD area and you're in any way interested in buying and selling a home, commercial property, land, need to consider reaching out to Uptown Realty. They're based out of Sumter and run by a friend of mine, Patrick Enzer, big Clemson guy, used to cover the Tigers in a newspaper capacity, longtime supporter of Tiger Illustrated, longtime listener to the Dubcast. The home buying process should be an enjoyable experience, so let Patrick and his staff do all the heavy lifting. All you got to do is pick up the phone and call 803-774-0435 or go to UptownRealtySC.com. Okay, to our interview with Terrence Oglesby, man, if you like old stories from the Oliver Purnell days, you're going to love this. Terrence Oglesby is, in my opinion, is a future star at the basketball analyst thing. Does a tremendous job. We talk about that with him and much more. Here we go. Enjoy. Okay, joined by Terrence Oglesby, who goes back a long way. I don't think we're, we're certainly not best of friends, but I think we remember each other from a long way back. How you doing, man? I'm hanging in, baby. I, it's a different time. I got my kids here in the house, ten o'clock on a Friday, so it's uh, it's a little bit different. I can't promise nothing catastrophic won't hit my office door here in the next twenty minutes, but uh, other than that, we're doing pretty well. We're happy, and uh, we're back in Clemson, so that's good. How old are your kids? Four and three. Okay. Bananas, both of them. Uh, they're both they're both really good kids. I got Damon's my oldest. He's uh, he's into every sport there is. He's a huge Trevor Lawrence guy. I got him a Trevor Lawrence jersey for Christmas, and he wears it every day on top of his sweatshirts, on top of jackets. It has to be seen. So he's he's really adopted Clemson. And then uh, my daughter's a little girly girl. She's into cheerleading and dresses. I think she changes outfits about six times a day. So. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're a lot to keep up with, but they're good kids, and, and their mama really takes good care of them. Well, as someone who has been through the experience of raising kids uh, in this community, they're now in middle school, I can't th- can't think of a better place to, to, to have and, and, and raise a family, uh, just a really, really good community. Yeah, we're, we're really happy. We lived here. We, when I when I decided to come back to school and work with uh, Brownell and Company, we moved back here. And we just, you know, I, the, the neighborhood we live in, I didn't even know was a neighborhood when I was at Clemson. You know, I had no idea, you know, the surrounding areas. I basically knew uh, where my dad and mom lived, which was up on Lake Kiwi when I was playing. And other than that, I didn't really know the surrounding areas, but what a great place to be. You know, our neighbors are great. Our neighbors are professors at the university and, and uh, our kids love their daycare and they're going to go uh, to school in town. So we're just, uh, we're, we're so happy that we found this place and, and my wife's happy, which means I'm more happy. Terrence, the reason that I called you uh, to, to, to be on the podcast, I actually had you on the list for a while, but 
I turn on the uh, Miami Clemson basketball game recently, and it, we've had some real blackout problems here, uh, television wise, for Clemson basketball, and it's been frustrating. So I turn on the radio that day. I guess it was the day after the the Sugar Bowl. But man, you, I'm not saying this just to say it. You have a future in this business, <laughs> and you should be like a national analyst you are that good man i got i uh, you're just a natural i, I hope you're right <laughs> is, that, is that what no, you want to do yeah that's all i want to do it's all i work on like when, whenever i do do something whenever you know I, that weekend was pretty interesting in particular because i had uh we flew down Qualk and i flew down on friday watched the sugar bowl together and then on saturday we did the men's game on sunday we did the women's game on monday I do the play-by-play at Anderson University, and I did it by myself because the guy who I usually work with, Austin Garrett, he uh, he had COVID. So I did that by myself on Monday, and then on Tuesday, I did an ESPN Plus game between USC Upstate and Longwood. So that was kind of it was a four game in four day, but uh, I love doing it, man. You know, I I thought I wanted to coach and I I started to realize that, Hey, I really enjoy my kids and I really enjoy my wife and I'd like to be able to see them. And I don't want to miss my, my kids growing up. I want to be able to be there for them. I want to be at practices. I want to be at, you know, dance recitals and all that. So I I got out of coaching, but, uh, I, I work hard at the, at, at not only the color commentating, but basically any aspect of media I've been trying to, uh, uh, you know, get more comfortable with, and uh, I, I really enjoy doing games, and I, I really enjoy you know doing radio shows, whatever it is, radio shows or uh, my show on Thursday nights, uh, which uh, I do on YouTube quite a bit, and it's just a basketball show it talks ACC hoops, more specifically Clemson hoops. And I just really enjoy that aspect of uh, teaching it, and uh, that's kind of how I see it. I, I still like teaching. It's just a different manner in which I can teach it. So, and I don't like to get too. One of the, I think one of the most important parts of it for me is, especially in the state of South Carolina. You know, I'm not naive to the fact that it's a football state. So I want football fans to understand what they're watching when they're watching basketball. So that's kind of my. Uh, I don't want to get too far in the weeds. I want to keep it good for the common fan, and I still want it to be relatable for everybody. And I really enjoy doing it. This is it's one of the most enjoyable aspects. I still love basketball. It's still uh, it's in my DNA, man. Like I, I don't know how else to say that. But I really love being around basketball. I love being around the coaches. But the uh, you know the the six thirty in the morning until. 8.30 at night, those days, uh, th- those days I'd prefer if I'm going to work all day, and I still work all day, I'd rather than be at home where I'm around my kids and such. Mm. Th- that was a long answer to get yeah. just to, so sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, it was a great answer. Um, do you remember when that crystallized for you, that, that you realized, okay, coaching, not my thing, and I want to pursue uh, the broadcast thing? I, um, you know, I went to school, I was a communications major at Clemson. Uh, with a psychology minor, but I really knew I wanted to do broadcasting pretty early because I enjoyed every aspect of media, whether it was radio or uh, television. You know, I, I, I was a magazine. I was one of those kids that all these preseason magazines would come out. I'd read them cover to cover when I wasn't pro- when I wasn't outside playing. And uh, I, I just enjoy every bit of it. And I enjoy the excitement around it. But really, it crystallized when I came back. Uh, my first year, I was still finishing my undergrad after playing overseas for nine years. And uh, what year? I finished. Gosh, what year was it? It was it was the Sweet Sixteen year. Okay. So that was my that was my first year back. What was that? Two thousand was that twenty eighteen, twenty nineteen, or twenty seventeen, twenty eighteen? I can't remember which one it was. I just remember the times. Mm-hmm. I don't remember yep. the exact year, but um, you know, I was kind of a jack of all trades. Like wherever they needed me. Uh, when I say they, I mean Brown Allen Company, uh, I would do it. So they came up to me one game before the first game of the year, and Tim Beret couldn't make it because he was at a football game at, at, a, at the College of Charleston. We were having a tournament. It was like the Charleston Classic, and they needed somebody to do the radio. So they came up and they asked me, well, would you, would you be interested in doing it? I was like, well, shoot, yeah. That's where I, that's what I went to school for. I mean, that'd be fun. And then, you know, I, I, all my homework was done for me because I was 
being a part of the scouting team or the scout team in practice. And I knew all the personnel and, you know, I, I was, I was eating up with that stuff and it just kind of fell into my lap. So I, I did the coaching thing. It's almost like I had a three year internship to get into it because I, I, I found out how to scout on my own and do all those things. And then the product just kind of rolled out itself whenever I was doing radio with Qualk. And obviously I've improved since then, but that was the first time that I did it. And I was like, man, this was, this was really enjoyable. And I was sitting on the other side and, and I, I realized that now I don't have to, I, in that position, I wouldn't have to live and die with every shot. Mm-hmm. So I, I, that was a big thing for me because I mean, Larry, you've known me for a long time, man. I'm a competitive dude now. Yeah. And to be able to take your foot off the gas a little bit after I played for so long, I still get excited for it, but I don't necessarily have the downfalls anymore to where like that after game, after a loss or something, you're just miserable. And uh, I, I enjoy being able to go home, win or loss or whoever. I'm still happy. So uh, I didn't want that to affect my mood, but that was the first time that I really was like, man, I really like this. And I, I think this is another way for me to stay in it without having to, you know, be out, be in the office 14 to 16 hours a day. That's really fascinating that you had that sort of the transition from being 100 percent emotionally invested to then being like, you know what, I you know, that sort of detachment. And that's really what I what a lot of average fans that I, who I've encountered over hell two decades Mm -hmm. they really don't totally a lot of them really don't totally get you know what my job is and i think it applies to you as well like i try to explain to them like no i'm not crushed you know if clemson loses like first of all i'm trying to do a job Mm -hmm. and second of all it's a job (laughs) (laughs) win or lose I, i i come home and crack open a beer and watch other football games and and uh, you know, it doesn't even matter. I sleep fine. And so it's interesting that that you had that sort of shift as well, maybe to a lesser extent, because obviously you're a Clemson guy, uh-huh. but still that sort of um, clinical view of a game that you, that you sort of have to have if you're going to do it right in a broadcasting realm and also, I guess, the writing realm in my, in my, uh, in my case. Yeah. Well, I, th- that's a good point. It, it is now. I, I'll be honest. I want. Uh, I'm going. I'm just going to call it the current administration, Brown Allen. I want them to do well because they did a lot of good for me personally. So uh, it, it would be hard for me. I, I'll never root against them. Sure. Uh, but it's it's still the ability to sit back and be objective about it. That that's kind of that's kind of the hard part because like I know what's going wrong. It's just sometimes it's it's like the way I would coach and the way I would be a part of it, I'd be like, that's okay. This is how it's fixable. And so instead of dwelling on the negative, and that's what I want to do. I don't want to dwell on the negative in, in my new line of work. I want to emphasize how it can be fixed. I, I feel like I'm a problem solver. not a, not. I, I don't want to magnify the problems as much. Um, so I want to be able to, I, what's the right word? Maintain hope. Yeah, <laughs> for, sure. Or it doesn't matter. Like um, it doesn't matter if it's Clemson or I'm talking about Wake Forest. Like Wake Forest has got right now they've got uh, a talent disparity significantly, but they've also got Carter Witt and Coach Steve Forbes has got them playing incredibly hard, and they're playing together, which has not been the case at Wake Forest for the past five or six years under Danny Manning. So there's reason for optimism there. So I would rather like reinforce how impactful Carter Witt's going to be for the demon Deacons over the night, over the course of the next four years, as opposed to, man, they are really under talented. Does that make sense? Sure. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what that I want to be. I I want to be more like that as opposed to being like, ah, this sucks or that sucks. I I, I don't want that. That's not my goal. Fair, fair mindedness. Yes, exactly. Right. And, 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 People are going to be negative enough on their own. Yeah. <laughs> so, look, I don't want to be a part of that. I, I, I really enjoy it. And Larry, to be honest with you, I think a big part of the reason I'm like that is because I realize how much work goes into it, both as a player and a coach. Uh, you know, there's hours upon hours of scouting film and breaking down opponents and how we're going to attack this and how we're going to attack that. And as a player, it's, man, I got to get in. I got to 
to treatment. I got to make sure I'm healthy. I got to make sure I eat with enough time before practice. So if I go to practice, I don't throw up. And like, I got to make sure I get out of practice and shower so I can get to tutoring. And I might not get to shower. I might stink walking into tutoring. Like, it's a lot of stuff. And I, I respect and I appreciate how difficult it is. So I don't want to come in and, and jump on top of some of these kids when they're not playing well. I'd rather emphasize things that sometimes they could do better. But at the same time, I want to give credit where credit is due because if they're doing something well, I'd rather dwell on that. Well, and and something that I've learned in, you know, a long time of interacting with Clemson fans, you know, my subscribers, the people who pay my salary, right. is that even the the most diehard fans who are the most passionate as they can be about Clemson, the large majority of them – they don't want like constant Kool Aid. They and they and they also don't want like constant ripping of their team. They want some approximation just of the truth in a fair minded way, right? So there are times when I can disagree with 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 some of my subscribers, but it's a respectful disagreement and I think most of them know that I'm being fair minded in some of my conclusions that I make and uh am not gonna just trash anybody recklessly. So I think that's kind of refreshing that, you know, you can, you can have even uh, the most passionate fans out there who still, they still just want something close to the, to the truth. They don't want you feeding them, feeding them one extreme or the other. Neg- negative yeah, or positive. It's, it's, it's a tough balance that quite frankly, I'm still working with because, you know, I, I hate to keep bringing up my show, but last week on my show, I basically, I, I was like, this is what make Clemson, makes Clemson dangerous and they're good. Well, that was a lot of things about Amir Sims and how he can get the ball and take off and transition and make decisions. And he's so good at different things as far as getting his teammates in the right spots. And then they dropped two in a row and there wasn't a whole lot of positive going on besides their offense finally started to pick up and against Georgia tech. But like, I, if I would have gone on yesterday and been like, no, it was great. It was great. It's just rust. It's just rust. Well, it wasn't just rust. They right. weren't, they weren't communicating. They didn't play well. And, you know, they got their, their butts handed to them because they weren't communicating at the level they were pre COVID break. So, I mean, like if I don't say that, you know, it stinks because like, I, I feel like sometimes like Amir Sims will watch it. And I love Amir, man. He's a great dude. And, and, and some of the guys will watch it. And I don't want it to be seen as me just going out to get those guys because I know the position they're in. But at the same time, if I'm not critical of some of those aspects, then it's not genuine. And, and Larry, one thing I strive to be, I am me. I'm not going to fake much. Like I'm pretty genuine in a lot of my actions, especially now, maybe not 12 years ago on the lake, but, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, you know, I, for who I am, uh, I don't want to fake it. Like I am what I am and, and that's the way it's going to be. And it's just, it's a, it's a balance that I'm still trying to figure out and I hope I'm doing a good job. I try to be as fair as possible. Well, I watched your, I guess it was your, the, the instant reaction uh, video that uh, I guess immediately the night, the night of the Georgia tech game. Uh-huh. And I don't see how anybody could argue. I mean, I think the two, two of the, uh, most interesting th- takes that, that I that I took away, um, I guess informative takes were, hey, you know, look at this team's free throw attempts over the last few games. They're not being physically tough enough, you know, um, mm-hmm. to, to 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 be, you know, have uh, aggression, you know, driving the ball to the basket. And then also you you noted that hey, they don't seem totally engaged right now, which. They don't. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean that <laughs> it's not just a matter of oh, well Virginia and Georgia Tech were just unconscious from 3 and the law of averages is going to even out and then after that this team will be fine. No, it's 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 way more than that. I mean, you, first of all, you got to maybe give them a more obstructed view of the basket on those three-pointers which haven't yeah. hasn't, hasn't been uh, those have been few and far uh, between and then as you mentioned, the physical toughness that comes with protecting the ball Mm-hmm. Uh, at the top of the, you know, when, when you're when you're at the top of the key, you know, I can't, man, how many turnovers have there been in that in that area? Yeah, uh, they had twenty, and and the problem, is, and 
that's one of the reasons their defense hasn't been good or wasn't good against Georgia Tech is because, man, they turned it over so much they could never set up their defense. So they were constantly in scramble mode. Mm -hmm. And it just, it it was brutal. But no, you're right. It was just uh, the law of averages. I'm, that's kind of, uh, I took a person, uh, it was like a coaching personality test. It was a company out of Charlotte. They made me do it whenever I got the job at Carson Newman. And, and he said, you know, one of Terrence's weaknesses is, and you're going to laugh at this because you saw me when I played, but he's not necessarily a huge numbers guy. He's much more of a feel guy. Mm. Now, if you take that back to my playing career, <laughs> I think like like I might be zero for four, but if those suckers felt good, number five, six, seven, eight, and nine are going up, and and I there, and it hurt my career quite frankly, especially when I turned pro. Not so much in college, but when I turned pro, it hurt me because you know if I, I was the same way, I could go zero for ten, and that'd be fine with me, but the problem is, is it would hurt my percentages and the chances of getting a job next year and a higher pay and all that. So it hurt me, but, but I see the game more as energy and why things happen, not necessarily the numbers. Now I've learned to, uh, I, I, I try to put pressure on myself to observe the numbers so they can be ancillary factors to why something is happening. For example, turnovers, the number of turnovers. So because I, because I found that out about myself, I feel like I'm always learning like where my weaknesses are. And my wife tells me where my weaknesses are all the time. But, but like the, the numbers thing for me, that was, that was fairly eye opening because I, now I really have to force myself to sit down and be like, this is why production, this is what I feel. Are there statistics to back up what I feel? And if there are, then I'm typically not far off in my opinion. And, and that was a hole of mine. And it was a hole of mine when I played, you know, who was really good at it. Larry was Casey rivers. Mm. Like Casey rivers always thought about, okay, so I'm four for six right now from three. We are up. Eight points with three and a half minutes to go. Are we going to be able to hold on to this lead? And I'm already four for six. That's a great night. I'm I'm not necessarily going to take an open a three unless it's wide open. Mm-hmm. So like there are guys. I think guys that protect their numbers, like Shane Battier, James Jones, Mike Miller, guys like that. They have success for a long time. Uh, especially at the NBA level and professional levels, but guys like me, not so much. The Jimmer Fredettes, the, ball, the the guys who are like, well, if we're down twelve and it's two minutes to go, that's four threes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like those guys kind of kill themselves, and that's kind of that's kind of the story of my career. <laughs> so it's like after I left, it's like you know I, I could have had a much more successful career if I would have been a little bit more cognizant of my numbers situational awareness combined with emotional maturity, I guess. I, I guess. And the fact that I'm not in the direct line of fire uh, <laughs> also helps, but it's, it's something that I brought with me over to the I, long, long story, extremely short. And they're all long stories with me, but uh, that has helped that recognition has really helped me uh, when it comes to analyzing the game from a little bit of further point away. Hmm. Um, so how do you, so you mentioned you, you've done some ESPN yeah. stuff. How does that come about? Do you have to market yourself? Do you, are you just sort of on call? And then what's the next step for you and how do you best position yourself, um, you know, to, to, to take that next step? You know, I, I just started bugging people and asking questions. Um, I, I got a number from, uh, Mark Childress, who's a friend of mine, uh, his, his son Faxon is the guy who, go, who does my show with me. Uh, you, you know, I, I just start asking questions and I, and I ask people who are somewhat in the know. So uh, last summer, I, I went straight to Don Munson's office. I went straight to, and he's like, well, you need to talk to Rick Bagby. So I go to Rick's office and I go and Rick's like, well, you need to talk to this guy. So I go to the next guy's office and the next guy's office. And I basically, um, I, 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 I ask questions until I get answers. And then 
you know, I get in t- charge with the guy at Upstate who, who picks talent and does all those sort of things. And I'm like, hey, I'm available. I'll send my resume. And obviously it's pretty lengthy given that, uh, you know, I played for a long time. I have two degrees from Clemson now. What do you mean and by Upstate? USC Upstate. Oh, I got you. I'm so, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, so I'll get uh, – yeah, sorry about that. So I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that I get in contact and I send my, my resume to him. And it's pretty lengthy, so he'll give me a game. And then, you know, after every game, I go and rewatch it, and I obviously pick pick myself apart. But then I also cut down some film to about two and a half, three minutes of, you know, just me uh, analyzing the game in, in one aspect or another. So I, I basically make clip reels after every game I do. On, and your, then, own, on your own, on your own initiative. Yeah, yeah. so I, I – I clip all those games. I learned how to clip uh, these movies myself on iMovie mm-hmm. on my computer because there used to be other softwares that I had access to when I was still coaching that made it a lot easier. But I, uh, I obviously don't have access to that now because they're very expensive. But now I went on iMovie and I figured out how to – I did all this on my own initiative and I and – I, was able to adjust the volume to where we can go in and out of highlights and things of that nature. So when the clip's over, I don't necessarily just scare the person watching it with the next bunch of volume. I ease them into it. So I try to make the production value as good as it can be in two and a half, three minutes. So I've done that with two games so far. I did uh, Clemson's women's and college of Charleston. That was my first ever game on television. I did that with Fred Cunningham. And then I did, uh, Upstate and Longwood's men, that was with Brock Bowling, and uh, that was my second ever game. And I get compliments because they say, oh, I thought you've done this for years. Well, I've only done two on television. Wow. And I'm just kind of poking around. And, uh, you know, a lot of it is self-analysis, and a lot of it is just, man, pick your pants up and figure it out yourself. And so what's the – I mean, have you – have you reached out to like current, I guess, established broadcasters, uh, ESPN types, or maybe the, some folks in Bristol? Have you have you begun to try to lay the groundwork for that, and maybe it, I guess, at least gotten some insight into from them into how that, what that path looks like? Uh, I I had coffee last week with Eric McLean. I've talked to uh, Kelly several times. Obviously, I'm a guest on their show uh, on out of bounds uh, fairly frequently and then you know I, uh, many of the broadcasters remember me west durham he, he's he's a super nice guy i've yeah. asked him questions i've talked to debbie antonelli that was a couple of years ago but it, it's more so i understand kind of how that works and they have say but they only have so much when it comes to talent because i mean they are the talent so now I'm, I'm kind of poking around the, the, the back rooms and the operations piece. Like I ask uh, a couple of the guys over at Clemson, like, who can I get in contact with? And then they, they tell me. So it's, uh, then I start, I, I just bug people, man. I, I don't know how to say that differently there. I, I just bug people. And the reason I do it is because I'm passionate about it. I know I'm, I feel like I'm good enough to be on there. It's just, I realize it's almost like, now, there's nothing right with COVID. I feel like I, because of COVID, I have been able to, one, realize that nobody's hiring anybody right now, mm-hmm. at least for the this year. So it's almost relieved some pressure in that I can say, well, right now is a great time for me to work and establish who I should be contacting, talk to who these people are, make sure that they know that I'm available and I'm still working my butt off. Even though currently I'm not employed by them, they will know the product that they will be getting if they decide to pay for the product. Mm -hmm. So it has been a good thing for me to be able to, um, because there's no pressure to get hired, there's also, I, I see it as an opportunity to where like, I can get all this information right now without having to compete with anybody and and, you know, I, I feel like, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but this is how I feel. I, I feel like a lot of people that are, 
without jobs or, or doing certain things right now. And, and I have, I consider this a job. I do some other things. I, I'm part of real estate. I'm part of some real estate activity down in the Atlanta area. And, that, and I, I'm, I'm a part of a lot of different things. So it, I don't want it to seem like I'm just at home in my basement, uh, bothering people and being all creepy <laughs> or whatnot. But like, it's Terrence again. How you doing? Yeah. What'd you have for lunch? Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, it's just, uh, <laughs> Uh, no, it, it's, it's, I feel like a lot of people feel like, well, nobody's hiring right now. I'm just going to sit on my hands. And, and I don't, I don't want that to be the case with me. It's interesting. I, I'm sure you've heard like whenever, uh, like a coach or a player, mainly, I guess at the professional level, when they take issue with something or a media person says, whether it's a TV person or sports writer or whatever, it's like, yeah, he never played the game. He doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, they play that card. Um, but the fascinating thing to me is that as many media personalities who have never played the game have made fools of themselves, I have found just as many um, <laughs> media personalities who have played the game or coached the games have just as much of a capacity to make fools of themselves yeah. by not doing their homework. It's so, it, it just jumps out when you have a coach or whoever it is who's being lazy. It's brutal. It's brutal. And like, uh, it drives Larry, I know it drives you nuts. It drives me even more nuts because it's guys that I want to replace. <laughs> and like, and it's like, I sit there and I, I'll give you an example and I'm not going to name names, but there was a television show at the beginning of the season. It was like a preseason look ahead. And this individual had a couple of hall of fame coaches and I'm not going to go into detail. And I just want to preface this by saying I watched every single preseason show for every major conference. So this individual has done has not done his homework and he goes in and starts asking about recruiting and it's, it's, it, <laughs> I'm trying to phrase this to where I, I, I don't give it away, Sure, but it's like this particular coach has, I'm not going to say gotten lucky, but for the most part, he's gotten really good players from not so common areas. And this person is saying, well, you get all these McDonald's All-Americans and the coach is sitting there looking. And he's like, no, no, I don't. And it's live oh. and he panics and he doesn't have a back and he doesn't have a backup plan and he didn't do his homework. So it was like I'm sitting there. I'm just like, you have got to be kidding me. Like, is your you're about to be. I, I consider a I, I consider ACC network, SEC network, like national television. You're about to be on national television and you don't do your homework. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. And, and is it is it not important enough to where you would go down the list of every team in the SEC, every team in the Pac-12, to where you know their recruiting situation, you're interviewing coaches? You, like, how could you not know – who Colorado is bringing in right. arbitrary school, arbitrary school. Like, how could you not know that that stuff drives me insane? And I'm not saying I'm not going to screw up from time to time because I know I will. Everybody makes mistakes, but it can't be that brutal. And then it takes away from the, it, it takes away from the validity of your show. In my opinion, like, like how am I supposed to look at you and listen and take your advice when you obviously haven't done your homework. That's a, like Dan Orlovsky. I, I like him because he gets, he catches a lot of crap. At least you can tell he does his homework. Right. You know what I mean? Like his opinions might be bad sometimes. <laughs> Other times they might be great, but at least he does his homework. So like, I'm okay with it. I just don't understand how you can go into something knowing that you're going to be on national television and not do your homework. I just want to smack you through the television. I, I, I know you feel the same way. Yeah, and, and that's just what I, what really grates my nerves when I hear the old uh, he never played he or she never played the game dismissal. You know because. Um, <laughs> hey, let me say this, say this, guys like you who who really enjoy the game and maybe you didn't play, but me. This is a reason, like, I enjoyed talking to the media when I played. Like, you guys are what makes it great because you're spreading the word. You're getting the word out. 
Like, if you didn't play, like, you've done all your homework, you know all the numbers, you know the circumstance with this guy or that guy, injury situations coming out. Like, that's what makes this stuff great. It's not necessarily like, I, I, as much as I'm a basketball guy and I want to say, hey, man, the product is what sells it. Not necessarily. It's everything else around it. And the game is the focal point, but there's a lot that goes into it. And and uh, it just irritates me when people kind of disrespect that process. Well, that's a good way to put it. Um, all right, let's go way back. What? Um, <laughs> let's get can, off this. Let's talk some hoop. <laughs> we, won't, we won't talk about the lake yet, but uh, <laughs> the first, I want to talk about the Purnell days and yeah. uh, refresh us on how you ended up at Clemson and... Um, and just that whole process coming out of high school. Well, you know, the, the person who kind of got it all going for me was Jim Davis. Uh, Jim Davis is from Charleston, Tennessee. It's about 15 minutes up the street from um, Cleveland, Tennessee. And he was in town recruiting a girl that was on the team at my high school. And him and my dad used to work basketball camps together when my dad was in college, so they saw each other. And, and Jim was like stuck around for the game because I was playing, and I went for thirty or something. And he went back to uh, he went back to uh, Ron Bradley or and Oliver, and was like, "Hey, there's a kid in Tennessee. You ought to go check him out." So that summer, uh, Ron Bradley came to watch, and it, it made pretty short order, and they offered me fairly quickly. And to be honest with you, I didn't know much about Clemson at the time. I knew they had a top 25 football team, usually hovering in the 15 to 25 range at the time. Uh, that's when Charlie Whitehurst was quarterback, and they had all those kids sitting on the hill. And uh, I, I, I remember a little bit about that, but I was also getting attention from – I really liked Michigan because Coach Amaker was the coach there, and Michigan obviously with the Fab Five, there's all kinds of stuff. And I also really liked Seth Greenberg up at Virginia Tech. Now, there were other Power Five schools, but the second that I set foot on campus – uh, it was very similar in topography to where I was from with the rolling hills and the green trees and the green grass and all that. I was very comfortable as soon as I got on campus and it had everything I need and nothing I didn't. And it was, a, it had just been named a top 25 public university in the country. And on top of that, I love the way that Purnell was, I love the per- way that Purnell was coaching. Uh, you could see the wind improvement from year to year to year. Uh, so obviously something was going right. And quite frankly, it was a team at that time that needed some skill. Uh, you know, you had Vernon Hamilton, who was a senior when I was a senior in high school. We never actually played together, but super athlete, really good defender, not the most offensively skilled player. You had Cliff Hammonds, unbelievable athlete, James Mays, unbelievable athlete, Sam Perry, Ray Sykes. You had all these guys and they really needed somebody to give them some space. So that was kind of our big point. Like, hey, there's a chance to really come in and, and, and play and compete right away. And this team's moving up. So that was, it, it made it pretty short order, especially when it came to uh, style of play and things of that nature. And basically, I, I was a sniper. Like, they, could ju- they just let me wander the court and, and look for shots. And they they wanted me to replace Shawan Robinson. I don't think I was as good of a ball handler as Shawan was, but you know it it worked out really well because not only when when I came, but they brought in Demontez, rest in peace, who is a great, who is a really really good college player. Jare Grant, another great athlete, and uh, it just kind of I, I knew the second that I got onto campus that that I was like, man, this 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 place is for me. What's your most treasured memory from those days? Huh. On the court or off? Both. Do it separate. Um, shoot. You have to give me a second. On the court, Florida State at home my freshman year when we went into double OT. That was one of the, that's the loudest I've ever heard little John. Mm-hmm. Um, I set the record for overtime points that game. And then, um, obviously, the Maryland game was huge because it got us into the tournament. Um, off the court, man, everybody talks about the breakout game with C.J. Spiller, where there was Georgia Tech, and he sent a couple of guys into the 
into the crowd, <laughs> duking them out. Yeah. I, that was my official visit. Oh wow! That was my visit. So that was awesome. Um, now, as far as there wasn't really one day that stood out more than anything, but it's amazing how much you, you realize now that you're removed from it, how much you were taken care of, but like being able to go into Leslie, Leslie Moreland's office just to talk. And, and, you know, we had so many good tutors and Becky Bowman was there and it was a great, it was just the environment around it. I really enjoyed being around John Sanderson, who was, um, the strength coach at the time. He's currently at Michigan. You want to talk about full circle, Hmm. but, uh, uh, being around the guys more than anything. I wish, I wish I would have gotten along with some guys a little better, made a, made a bigger effort to be nice, but I was always so competitive and so driven that sometimes I regret that I kind of overlooks the importance of those things. Uh, as far as being a teammate and hanging out with your friends and doing all that stuff, I was always like, well, I got to get home, get to sleep and things of that nature. Cause I was like, oh, I gotta, I gotta prepare for the next thing. I got to prepare for the next thing. And, uh, you know, I, I, I would say probably Vickery Hall is what it used to be called. Now it's Neary, where the Oculus is, where they do all their academic work. But that building was special because that's where all the sports were together. And it, and I was always so fascinated walking into that place because um, the size of human that plays at Clemson. <laughs> <laughs> Like, like, like I'm, I'm coming from Tennessee. You want to talk about big fish, small pond. Uh, I'm coming from Tennessee and I'm feeling pretty good about myself. Well, my, the first day I walk in, Miguel Chavis walks in beside me <laughs> and M- Miguel was about six, five, two ninety five, walking as a, in as a college freshman, Jarvis <laughs> Jenkins walks in right behind him. Jarvis is the most lovable human on the planet. He's loud and talking and, 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 you know, you got volleyball players, these, these beautiful six foot five goddess looking woman, when you're women, when you're walking in, you're like, what is going on right now? I, I feel like I'm in the Amazon. <laughs> and like, it, it was like, it was such a, to me, that experience at Vickery to where all these people were there and the personalities and the different sports. And it was like, to me, that's what made it special. I, I know that's a weird thing because obviously you want to talk, well, I went to triple D's and all that stuff. I didn't go out. Uh, you know, that my social hall was the academic places. Yeah. And uh, man, that was, uh, I, I really enjoyed Vickery because it was a place where you weren't necessary or a lot of the students weren't guarded or a lot of student athletes weren't guarded because you were kind of, everybody kind of knew what you were going through. Everybody was a little sore. Everybody was a little tired. Everybody didn't really want to be there, but they were still happy to see you. Like it was a good environment there. And I really enjoyed, I I really enjoyed that part. It's really interesting. I had Woody Dantzler on, on the podcast, I guess maybe over the summer and Uh his, the most treasured part of his college experience involved nothing that he did on the football field and he did quite a lot on the football field his his what he grabs onto the most is just the cultural experience of being on a college campus and and meeting people who are you know who are from different countries and experiencing Mm -hmm. new things and and it's just so refreshing that you know some in in what is viewed you know, commonly as sort of a meat market and and something where, okay, we know why these, 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 these highly regarded athletes are here. They're not here to, you know, to study. They're here to play football and to hear that it's so much more than that um, to to a lot of high profile players is, is really cool. I was about to cut you off and say like, Hey, all that's crap. Because like there's a lot of places where there's, I hate that people say it's a meat market because I mean, look, are the people that come to play football at Clemson, do they have high ambitions? Yeah, of course they do or else they wouldn't be good enough to play at Clemson. And like, obviously they want to get uh, to the NFL or they want to get to the WNBA or they want to get to the NBA or the major leagues or what have you. But like, you still have to fully immerse yourself or else you, one, you're not going to qualify Two, you're going to be miserable. And it's just, all that other stuff. And, and, you know, people will say, you know, they get extra help with their academics and all that. That's, that's not true. Like 
I did all my homework, like every bit of it. And, <laughs> and I know that guys, you know, there's times where guys have tutors, but they, they run a tight ship over there at Neary and all those places. Like there's not a whole lot of cheating. And if there ever is one, then they get caught pretty quickly. Like I remember specifically staying up all night after season was over because I had gotten behind on papers and things like that. Like you do get tutors, but at the same time, like you're doing your work and I I hate that. I I hate that people feel that way, but you know, it is what it is. I don't know if it's, if it's jealousy or, or what, what have you, but, uh, especially at Clemson. Now I don't, you know, you want to go over there and talk about LSU or something like that. Maybe there's something going on, but I know that at, at Clemson, you do all of your, you do all of your work. What I love about Jeff Davis, who I've known for a long time and his role presiding over the Paul journey over there, in the football offices is his job is to not give a damn thing about anything on the football field with those kids. You know, his job is to, uh, you know, prepare them for the real world and and to uh-huh. and to ha- and to impart real knowledge and real and rea- the reality being, you know, most of you guys aren't going to be in the NFL, and those of you who are aren't going to be there for very long. So now's the mm-hmm. time to to do internships and to start thinking about yourself as a man more than uh, you know, more than a more than a player, which I. You know that that's a, that's so important, uh, as you mentioned, and it's more than just uh, sort of a transactional relationship where you're these players are just sort of commodities based on what they can do for you. On a, uh, in, when eighty thousand fans are in the stands or ten thousand in the stands, at Little John. Yeah, I mean it, it is. It, it, it let's. I mean, I'm not kidding myself in saying that it's not a transactional re- relationship. Like I, I understand that it's, but. Uh, you know, it's funny. I was so one track minded whenever I was playing that I didn't really think about after too often. And now I'm sitting here, I'm 33 years old. I have two kids. And if I'm lucky, I'll have about 50 years left. And I still have, and, and I'm still young, <laughs> quote unquote. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I'm retirement age in one thing. And then I hit the rest of the world and I'm still young trying to figure it out. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's absolutely right. Uh, A lot of players aren't going to be able to do that. And it's, it's definitely an adjustment and it's where, and that's, I would almost say that's a little bit of a disadvantage of playing sports because if, you know, my, my goal was to play professional. Well, I played professional for nine years or eight years or whatever it was. And now what? So like I had, I had been one track minded for, Gosh, I knew I wanted to play professionally since I was in elementary school. I've been one track minded since then. So what now? And it just, the college is a process to figure yourself out. And I still have buddies who are 28, 29 and 30 who they still don't know what they want to do, but they kind of had a head start on me because they could start figuring that out in college. Most people aren't saying what now. And, and faced with that sort of existential question until they're like 60 years old, right? Like after retirement. <laughs> yeah. 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 No. And, and, and I've had to do the what now. Uh, I had a conversation with somebody yesterday, uh, literally yesterday. It was, a, it was a young coach. who's a very gifted communicator with players and things like that, but he's, he's still young and, and he's thinking about getting out because he just had a child and, he was asking me like, what was it like when you got out? I was like, well, my, my gray area was crutched because I went straight from playing to, to working at Clemson. But then I figured out I didn't want to do that. So my gray area was basically a year, three or four months to where, or a a year and some months to where it was like, what am I going to do now? I don't know what to do. I'm not going to coach. So like my gray area was pushed off. I was like, the hardest part about all that stuff is that three or four month gray period, because you just have no idea like what, what now, what can I do now? I talked to Taj Boyd about it uh, and he's like, you know, you, there's this part of you that you've always been regimented at schedule. Now I still operate best when I'm fairly regimented. So like I, I had to figure that out about myself. So in order for me to get anything done, I, I still need to hold that, that, 
fair amount of regimentation, if you will. So it's that gray area is so different and you hit that gray area so quick because you're right. At 60 years old, people are like, what now? Well, I had to go through that. What now at 30, 28, 30, 29, 30, whatever it is. And now I'm happy that I was able to find that to work through that gray area. And I hit a gray area during COVID. So I had no choice but to figure it out. Another loyal supporter of the Dubcast is Blackacre Law Firm in Greenville, a subsidiary of Parham, Smith & Archenthal. Blackacre helps South Carolina residents achieve their dreams of home ownership by providing experienced, professional representation for real estate closings. Attention to detail is crucial in real estate law. Blackacre is committed to making sure nothing gets by them preparing residential or commercial closings. Blackacre also offers estate planning services for their clients in the Greenville area. Find out more about Blackacre at 864-326-3500. Solero Communications, formerly known as Tandem Payment, is a full-service integrated electronic payments provider powered by leading-edge technology. Solero provides a wide array of merchant solutions, simplified payments. They make onboarding, taking payments, maintaining risk management and compliance, and getting support quick and easy. At Solero, they're all about helping you achieve sustainable growth as a business. Taking payments isn't the only thing your business needs. With Solero's solutions, you can manage inventory, sell products and services, Services via social media, schedule staff, track sales, get reports, and much, much more. Find out more about Solero at solerocommerce.com. That's C E L E R O commerce.com. Want to share a quick word about Founders Federal Credit Union? If you've been to a sporting event in Clemson, you've probably heard about Founders already. They are the official credit union partner of the Clemson Tigers. In addition to that, all Clemson faculty, staff, and students are eligible for membership as well as IPTA members. Matt Gross is a proud Clemson alum and the vice president for the Clemson market for Founders Federal Credit Union. Matt's office is located beside the Walmart neighborhood market on Old Greenville Highway in Clemson. For more information, go to Founders FCU Harris flooring has been a major part of the facilities enhancements over at Clemson, not just with athletics, but also at the university level. And we are thrilled that they are a part of the Dubcast as a sponsor. Since 1947, the Junkins family and Harris flooring have provided a unique shopping experience through value in their services, developing the right product solutions and delivering on their promises to check out some reviews on their work. Just go to their Facebook page, Harris flooring America rave reviews, just first class all the way. Phone number eight, six, four, six, four, two, six, one, eight, three. When you look back to the, the, the first round flame outs against Villanova and Michigan and Missouri, What's your assessment? Is it is it because there are lots of different opinions um, on maybe the style of play uh, not being conducive to NCAA tournament play? There's also those were three really freaking good teams <laughs> that y'all had to play. Yeah. How do you look back on that on those on those losses and why they happened? Well, now that I've coached, I see it differently than how it was as a player. Uh, I wasn't part of the Missouri loss. Yep, that's right. Sorry. <laughs> No, uh, you're good. But um, if you look back, the, the the teams were good. But if we were matched up with Villanova and Michigan, but not so much Villanova and Michigan, but uh, Beeline and Jay Wright. Yeah. So if you're gonna have if you're gonna have two coaches that are gonna figure out how to attack a press, it's gonna be Beeline and Jay Wright. If you run into uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to throw guys under the bus, but guys who, who are more intrigued with getting the right talent in there and just letting them go. If you would have found guys like that and played them in the first round, like it would have been different, but you had some, these X's and O's dudes who were just able to pick it apart. And not to mention, uh, the Clemson had a sophomore bonehead who got kicked out of the game and, uh, they ended up losing by three to Michigan. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, I look back at it as a player, it was like, man, I, I just felt tired. Uh, because one was the, was it a malicious, like me going at you elbow? Like I had no pre pre existing thing. Like I'm going to get this dude. It just kind of happened. Uh, I feel like today it would have been a flagrant one. It wouldn't have been like a, it wouldn't have been a uh, was it ejection, but that's neither here nor there. It happened. 
uh, I just remember being tired because of the circus that was around the tournament. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, you know, you go from, you have practice, uh, away from the media, then you have a practice with the media, and then you have an hour worth of media uh, on the day of the game, and then they still want to get their stuff in, but they don't want to do it at the media practice in case people are watching, so you have to do that. I just remember being really, really exhausted. Um, but from, you know, they, Villanova, we got up big, but we, were, we just looked tired in the second half, and they were throwing them in from everywhere. Um, the next year against Michigan, they played really, really good half court defense when they weren't in a one three one, and we were hoping they would play more one three one because that was kind of Beeline's thing until he got to Michigan. And uh, you know, they ended up playing a lot of man and, and really scouted us well. And uh, you know, it, it just one of those things like I couldn't hit open shots and everything was contested. Uh, I was frustrated, and then other guys were starting to get frustrated because they were still really good. They had Deshaun Sims and, and uh, gosh, what was his name? Manny. Um, what was Manny's last name? I don't I'm thinking remember. about. Yeah, but th- I mean, they had a really good team. Now, like, you can't take anything away from them. Like, they had a really, really good team. Both teams. But if you look at it from a coaching point of view, like we had a certain style, and those two teams that we played had certain styles and they were very, uh, they, they were chess moved a lot to where they were put in exact spots. And, uh, you know, if there was going to be a team to where they would find weaknesses, it would be between Jay Wright and Beeline. That's how I feel about it. It's the, in hindsight, it's a really fascinating sort of three year window to look back on because, you know, Purnell, ushers the program to this extraordinary success that they're not used to enjoying. Uh, you have a wonderful brand of basketball that really is magnetic uh, to the fans that has them crazy mm-hmm. about basketball. But then the <laughs> you sort of, there's a spoiled nature that ends up sort of creeping in because I remember, you know, after the first, after the Villanova loss, it's like, okay, I mean, you know, disappointing, but what a great season mm-hmm. happens again. It's like, okay, this isn't fun. And then a third time. And it's like, <laughs> we, we got to do something about this Purnell guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's like, wait a minute. Like y'all do, y'all do realize it's really, really hard to get there. And I think Purnell picked up on that and it probably bothered him. I don't know if that's why he, ultimately left but it it also i think looking back infected the um not necessarily in a negative way but the search process that ended with brad brownell because i distinctly remember terry don phillips saying we believe that brad's style is more conducive to uh, a, a lengthier run in the ncaa tournament the flaw in that thinking is again with the benefit of hindsight is you got to get there first and it's really hard to get there when you're clemson you know, that's a that's a loaded question. Well, it's uh, not, not really a question, just a just a statement. Yeah. Uh, and, and I'm yeah, not. I, it's well, I mean, he's proven that. I mean, he gets to the Sweet Sixteen. He won a game his first year in. Um, you know, it's it's. Let, let me let me rephrase. Let me rephrase. Yeah. I, that might have come out as as a uh, mistakenly um, as, as a oh well, one style is better than the other. I was more referring to the fact that it took, you know, after that first trip, it took a long time before they were able to get back. Um, mm-hmm. And it wasn't winning at Clemson is not necessarily, or you could argue it should not be fundamentally based on which style is going to get us farther into the NCAA tournament. Right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. It's more of a basic, okay, <laughs> we got to just win some games, you know. Because mm-hmm. it's Clemson basketball with, a, with not a whole lot of resources and a really brutal conference. I don't know if that came out better. Well, well I, first of all, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, you know, it's once you get to the tournament, it requires a certain level of, it, you know, it's, it's hard to argue about either one, really. I mean, they've both been tremendously successful. Right, right. For, for, for now, uh, at, one of the few coaches that you'll ever talk to that has never been fired. Yeah. And, and like, 
he is, uh, he, they say, they call it, in, in, one, one phrase I learned in coaching is they say, stay ahead of the mob mm-hmm. because eventually it's not going to be good enough. <laughs> <laughs> And like that's kind of I kind of chuckle at that because Purnell, right when the mob was starting to get a little bigger, he's like, "Hey, DePaul doesn't sound too bad, especially <laughs> for me, about twenty million." Yeah. Uh, but no, I mean, it, it's hard to argue about either one. Now, I will say this: Brownell's starting to get enough players in there to where like he's going to be able to get into the tournament more. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then once he gets there, obviously the game plan and the prep is huge. It's huge. I mean, look look no further than, you know, Beeline and Jay Wright kind of figuring out the press, mm-hmm. right? And uh, it's it's uh, it, it's you can't argue with either one. I mean, both of them have had varying levels of success. Uh, I, I would say that Brad's uh, version of winning, his way, his style, is more conducive to being more successful in the NCAA tournament. But maybe Oliver's style was more conducive to getting 20 wins because you overwhelm guys uh, with your athleticism. Everybody besides me, Larry. Uh, <laughs> but, like, uh, you know, you, you almost have to take one or the other. Um, where were you when you first heard the news that Purnell uh, had left Clemson? I was a little crazy because he was pissed at me because I left. Uh, I was in, I think I was in Spain. Uh-huh. Um, I was like, man, he got, he got really upset with me. And this dude bolted off in the middle of the night. Uh, so I, I understood it. I mean, they were going to pay him a ton of money. He's creeping towards the back end of his career. Uh, he, he's a, he, he likes the big cities. So Chicago would have made sense. I, I don't know that I was. I was kind of bitter because I had tried to get a hold of them quite a bit, Larry, like leading up to it. And they're like, yeah, we're going to go on vacation. But I had had people calling me on both ends and I was going to have to get into Euro camp, which is a big deal for young players overseas. And it was going to be difficult. And uh, so I had to make a decision fairly quick and I couldn't get a hold of anybody. So I ended up making that decision. And so this is a, this is a two month process because I had had people coming uh, especially European agents, because I had a European passport uh, coming over a lot, uh, flying over from Italy to watch us play at Georgia Tech and then getting back on the plane and flying back. Wow. Like things of that nature. So like I, this had been a long time coming. And finally they had, uh, I just, I had to make a decision and nobody called me back for a long time. So I was like, you know what guys, like, I have to make a decision. I've got money on the table. I got to go. And then whenever I heard that was going to happen, I was like, well, what, I mean, what's the difference? So whenever a kid puts him, puts his name in the transfer portal and they let him go or a kid turns pro, I, I, I never hold any animosity when it comes to that. Just because like, like, uh, Purnell, for example, uh, when he took off kind of in the same manner, but a little bit more abrupt, but I, it's hard. I mean, how could you be mad at a guy who's going to go make sixteen million dollars? Where like I, I, I can't be mad at him at all. So I, it was one of those things. I was like, well, good luck. I wonder who they're going to hire. So when did you next talk to Purnell after you made the decision to leave? <sighs> he called me. I had walked into the office finally and, and Posturin, Josh Posterino just happened to be in there. I was like, Hey Josh, I, I, I got to tell you something, man. I got to, I, I have, a, I have a pretty significant offer. I got to leave. And he was up at something in Maryland with, I, I think Don Munson. And he called me. And the last time I talked to him, uh, he was obvious. I was like, I want to go over and I want to learn to play the pick and roll and the point guard. Cause that's kind of the way the game was going at the time. And I was hoping I could, you know, learn how to Steve Curry. I wasn't naive to the fact that I wasn't going to be Steph Curry or something like that. I, I knew that I was never going to be a huge scorer if I were ever to get to the NBA level, but I felt like I could be a low attempt guy, come in, play 10, 15 minutes off the bench, uh, and things of that nature. But he was like, well, you think you're going to learn more than, um, uh, you think you're going to learn more over there than you would playing for me? And I said, Coach, I don't know, but I know that I'd have the opportunity to play point guard more than what I've been able to play here because 
obviously, DeMontez stood is there. They brought in Andre Young, who was also really good. And he hung up on me. Wow. So that was that. And I had, up to that point, I had still not signed with the agent. So I could have just reversed course. But when he hung up on me, I was like, well, I guess this is the right thing to do. So that's kind of how that happened. And then the next time you talked to him after that was when? Ten years later. Ten? I want to say uh, he called back when I was working at a G, as a GA at Clemson. He called Leslie, not Leslie. Um, oh man, I just had a brain fart of epic proportion. She's going to kill me. Uh, the lady who works the, worked the front desk for Clemson basketball, she, he called her. Susan? And I, I picked up the phone. Susan? I was, Ten years later. Susan Rourke? Yeah, Susan. It was Susan. Yep. Gosh, she's going to kill me if she listens to this. <laughs> and, you Susan, picked, and you picked up. Yeah. Why not? Oh, my gosh. Awkward. I'm a bit of a, no, I'm a bit of a turd. You know that. So, so well, I got, go ahead. I don't know. I, I just wanted to see how he was doing. I it, it, There was no animosity. Everything was done, and he'd made his money. He's living in Florida. So, like, I, I was just like, well, I just want to see how he's doing. So I picked up. And after I hung up, I kind of laughed and handed it back to Susan. But, I mean, was, yeah, 10 years. I remember, you might not remember this. This is after Purnell's gone, Brownell's in. I was over there playing the noontime basketball on a weekday, and you came and played with us. And I remember you saying, I, I, I mean, it definitely, you were kind of, you were bitter. You were like, hey, this Brownell guy is the real deal, and, and you weren't happy with Oliver. I didn't know why, uh, but now I guess there's more context to that. Well, I think I, you know, it is what it is. It, he, it, Oliver's a, he was a hands-off coach, um, more of a CEO kind of deal, kind of a saving, uh, like to where, you know, I would drop by the office, you know, back when it was over at Jervy. And I, I would be just to come over and kind of chat. And it was strange because I never really. And, and if you ask any of these guys this, that were coaching then, I, I never really felt welcomed, especially after Shaka left. Uh, Shaka was kind of the relationship guy who really dove in on that stuff. And I never really felt welcome. Uh, there was a clear separation. And uh, I'll never forget. I was, I played against Cliff Hammonds in the D league. I want to say seven or eight years later. And I was like, you know, what disappointed me was the fact that I, I wanted, I wanted a bigger relationship with the coaches and Cliff was confused. He goes, why? I was like, and he's like, I was like, well, uh, that's kind of how, you know, I went to one high school. I wasn't one of these kids that transferred high schools and transferred and transferred. and tra- I, I didn't do all that. I, I, I was raised, man, you, 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 uh, that name on your chest, that means something. So yada, yada, yada. So I, I wanted to have that relationship. Well, I, I, I never had that. You know, I, I have a, an okay relationship with Ron Bradley, but I talk to him once every seven, eight months, you know, it, whatever. But it just, it, we never, we, we, I think I talked to Purnell twice in two years outside of a basketball context or outside of a maybe a recruit being on campus. Wow. That's different. I, I don't like I'm dogging the guy because no, like it doesn't come up that way. Yeah, I don't want to sound like I'm dogging the guy. It's but it was more so that I was unfamiliar by how much of a business it actually is when it comes to the coaching profession. So like I was expecting it to be, I think, to be honest with you, Larry, I think you'll agree, but like, I, I think that uh, that's why Dabo has been so successful because he really invests in making sure that he knows that his guys are appreciated and that it's a culture of appreciation and it's a culture of like, Hey, I want to make sure you're doing okay. hundred percent. To where I don't think, I, I, I don't think Oliver, Oliver did not necessarily have that, but he was still successful. There's a lot of different ways to skin a cat. Uh, I would have preferred to have the relationship to where Cliff Hammonds did not. So I, I just, I always found that kind of intriguing and it never really hit me until I talked to Cliff that day. Like, man, maybe, maybe I'm the, in the minority there. Yeah. Tommy Bowden, was much closer to that 
emotionally distant CEO type, Purnell, and 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 Dabo is the opposite, and it has worked uh, worked really well for him in building a super strong culture that that really well, is able to withstand a lot of these these winds of change that are, you know player mobility and all that. Like Clemson's going to be okay even amid all that because of the culture that he is imparted which is built a lot on what you're talking about um or appreciation yeah co- connectivity or whatever relationships yeah. with uh with his players off the field hey, you know my dad uh, we haven't really talked about this but my, my dad was really successful in a lot of ways and and, and uh you know i he passed away a couple of years ago or a year and a half ago and, um i'm sorry i'd forgotten all about that yeah Thanks. so passed away a couple of years ago and he was a CEO of a, he was the first person in my in our family to graduate college he was the first person to do a lot of different things and he worked a lot and he was gone a lot when I was growing up but excuse me our relationship was really good but he was it was hardly ever and this is probably where I get it it was there was hardly ever a time where he focused solely on the numbers and it was one of the reasons that he only wanted to work private companies as opposed to public companies, because public, you have to really focus on quarterly earnings and all that nonsense. Private, you can put off immediate results to make sure your culture is in correct position to be successful in the long term. And, and that was his big thing was people, people, people. You can do all the numbers you want. You can do uh, all the analytics, whatever. But if your people are happy and they feel appreciated, then you're going to be able to retain people a lot more. Then you're going to be able to retain your employees. You know, he worked in nursing homes. It's a lot of CNAs, like CNA CNA workers at nursing homes. I mean, that's God's work. I mean, like you're taking care of the greatest generation and you're doing so much good for these for these people who have made their who who have made their victory lap. And you're at they are at the victory. And CNAs like some of these, some of these older people, like you got to help them use the bathroom and like, you got to help them move from one place to another. Some of them have to be fed. Some of them are in pain all the time and they're in a bad mood and CNAs do not get paid that much. And job retention with CNAs is not great because they don't feel appreciated. Dad was able to make sure these people felt, felt appreciated in the fact that, I mean, the work that you're doing, is really so important and so special to these people that you're taking care of that he was able to keep people employed because they felt appreciated. And I know that's a stretch to move it from that realm to the sports world, but I think a lot of the same things apply. So there's a lot of walk-ons that feel like, hey, man, I am here every day. I'm never going to see a little bit. I'm never going to see the field at all. I'm never going to see the floor at all. But it like, if I'm going to – stay here and continue to do this, I better be appreciated. And a culture of appreciation, I think that's the biggest thing that Dabo has done really well. And it's really admirable that he's been able to create that not only with his players, but with his staff as well. I've talked to some lower level staff members who are like, man, if I could stay here forever, I don't care about the pay. Like, I think that's significant. And I, I, that, that lasts a long time, as you know. I mean, janitors over there probably run through the wall for that guy, you know. They'd line up and put pads on if they could. Yeah, <laughs> like it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable, and he's just done such a good job. And and it's so corny for me to say this, but what made my dad uh, very successful are a lot of those things that Dabo has implemented over there, and it makes me so happy to see him do well because of those things. And I, I know that's I'm not trying to put <laughs> that sound that could sound bad, but it's a lot of those. Um, it's a lot of those lessons I learned from my dad, just kind of tailing him and, and him being frustrated and, and things like that. He's like, well, what can I do? I was like, well, I got to go back to focusing on people. And I, I and he, and Dabo's done a great job of that. And that's something I really, really admire about the guy. He bought y'all's lake house, didn't he? Dabo did way back when? He did what now? Didn't he buy a lake house from, from, from y'all way back when on Kiwi? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, now it's now it's for sale now for I think triple the price. <laughs> that is, cla- I heard. I mean, yeah, <laughs> like that, Dabo, classic Dabo, and he's gonna get it. Too. Doctor, I'm gonna get him. <laughs> <laughs> he is. If, if that guy weren't a football coach, he would be. 
I mean, he would be, had he stayed in commercial real estate, he'd be he'd, one of the most be, successful out there. He'd be just as rich as he is now. <laughs> Probably more it, so. It, 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 which avenue he's going to make it. All right. Speaking of Lake, that's a great transition. <sighs> I, I really distressed you by sharing this with you yesterday. You did. But, but, mess with you. um, you're breaking up a little bit. Oh, sorry. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Let me move, let me move my phone. Um, just to the refresher, uh, I guess back in like 2009 or so, uh, we had a family vacation out on the lake, and we're out there in my boat, which is not a nice wakeboard boat. It's a ski boat, and I got my family and friends, their friends, some really good wakeboarders, and we see this just top of the line. What, what was it, like a wake setter, Malibu wake setter? <laughs> just a deck yeah, out. A yeah, like, it was a wake setter. It was a night. We don't have it anymore. Well, you had it then, and we were and we were like salivating over it. And I'm like, look at that boat. And I'm, I look over. I'm like, that looks like. I see a lot. I see a lot of tall people in the boat. I saw Raymond Sykes. Like, that's Raymond Sykes. Oh, that's Terrence Oglesby. Oh yeah, that's right. They have a house nearby. <laughs> and then, <laughs> y'all were like tubing. And I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm were- sorry, but just as I have an, an issue, just as it grates my nerves to see a sports uh, 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 broadcaster. Um, not doing his homework. Um, it graced my nerves, I must admit, when I see a really nice wakeboard boat designed to, <laughs> to, to throw these massive wa- <laughs> wakes for wakeboards yeah. and surfers. I, it it, it grates my nerves to see them pulling a tube. So yeah. <clears throat> we're like, man, we, 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 <laughs> we need to... We need to ask him if we can get behind his boat and show him how to, how, you know, show him what those boats are made for. And mm. one of the friends is like, "You think he'd let us get a pull?" And so we sort of pulled near y'all. <laughs> I don't know what we said. I think one of the one of the friends was like, "Hey man, can we get a pull or something or something like nice boat?" And you didn't take it the right way, and like you like, you're like, I don't, you didn't, you didn't recognize me, but you're like. You, you were like in a sort of come at me, bro, kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of approach, and we're like, okay. So then we pull off. <laughs> but you, boy, that you were really marinating on that uh, yesterday. You're texting me. Oh, you're, bothered you're, me. You're like, it, man, I'm at, I'm at the Publix, like wondering when I was such a, <laughs> such a, such a jerk. A jerk. <laughs> no, I, you know, I'm, man, I'm one of those guys, and. and like you'll talk to Quark and some of those guys, man, I, I, I get stuck on something and like, I can't let it go. And I'm sitting here. Maybe I was just a little, I didn't, I didn't recognize you. I think that's, that's an obvious one. I didn't recognize you because I try to, but like I said, about 90% of interactions, uh, during that time, I try to be really nice, <laughs> but, uh, maybe, maybe the, maybe the lake, my personal bubble on the lake was in fringe. I wasn't sure. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what happened, but I'm sitting here thinking like, surely, to show God, like I, I wasn't just mean out of nowhere. I, I, <laughs> the, uh, it just, man, it's still bothering me. I'm sitting here like <laughs> racking my brain. You know what's crazy about that? Because if Raymond Sykes was out there, that meant David Potter was out there. I could probably call David right now, and David would be like, "Oh yeah, you were a jerk." Like, there's no question. <laughs> because David has, has a unique way of being able to tell me that I'm a jerk, but still making it kind of funny. So maybe maybe uh, that is true. <laughs> my, my memory is my memory is so fuzzy. It could well have been that one of my friends or family said, "You know, those boats aren't made for tubes or something like that." <laughs> Which then you would have been justified in getting a little uh, little boat up. I have no idea. I, I have no idea. But it has bugged me, and I'm just like, man, surely I wasn't made to Larry. Like, oh, is bad. like I, I, I'm walking around trying to pick tomatoes, and I can't even pick the right tomato because I'm so bothered about an interaction I had 12 years ago on a boat on Lake Kiwi. It's water, yeah, under, it's water under the bridge, as uh, I yeah, guess pun I'm intended. <laughs> no apology necessary. So, uh, Terrence, um, tell the listeners – if they don't already know how the best ways to, um, to watch your, your video uh, offerings beyond 22 basketball, that's right. And anything beyond that on YouTube. Yeah. Beyond 22 basketball. It's a, it's a show slash podcast. I, I break down film of Clemson's wins and losses. Uh, it's every Thursday at 7 PM. Uh, just search beyond 22. Uh, and it should pop up. Uh, I have a lot of fun with this to be honest with you, Larry. I, I I I enjoy that people get on there and go back and forth with me more than anything. It's practice for me. 
uh, to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it's, it's actually turned out to be a very good show. Uh, you know, I figured out, you know, all the graphics and everything like that. I, I do myself. Um, I do have a high school intern back there working a video board. I have facts and working with me, but as far as all the visuals and all those things go, I do all of it. So it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. I enjoy doing it once a week. And we talk, we go through the list of games. We go through the previous weekend with different teams. Uh, we've done power rankings. We've done players of the week. We've done, uh, good and bad tapes. And we, I've done scouting reports of, of teams, moving into the moving into the weekend so uh thursdays at 7 p.m it's on facebook it's on youtube we try to get on some other um, venues as well but we're still kind of in the process but it's uh it's been a lot of fun so i think people can write in and, and ask questions as the show is going and i'll answer them on air so i wish there was a way they could call in i don't quite i'm not that advanced yet but as far as online and things of that nature, we're going to, we're going to continue to uh, do that at least until the end of this season. Well, Terrence, once again, I am a fan. Like you, you sold me, like, I mean, it took me like three minutes of listening to you and that Miami game to be sold. And, and then now to hear about your work ethic and to learn more about the beyond 22 and all the stuff that's behind it. Like it's only a matter of time for you. Like I'm convinced. And, um, you you got future star written all over you in the in this uh, in this industry. So well, I appreciate. It. Did I tell you? Did I tell you that I, I probably should wait till we're off air? But uh, I told you I, I published my own magazine. It was a preseason ACC magazine. I did it this summer. Okay. So it's eighty two pages. It's a rundown of every team, every player on every roster uh, that's that was going to see minutes. It was a prediction. So obviously some of those predictions are wrong, <laughs> but, but uh, I designed and did that whole thing myself as well. It ended up being 82 pages. I used the wonderful people over at um, uh, East park printing. They helped me out with it. And mm -hmm. uh, just to kind of get the dimensions and all that stuff. But from every word on the, on the entire magazine to the design, to the pictures, to the schedules, to the predictions, uh, all ACC teams, everything. I did all of that too. So it's just, uh, it's been a lot of stuff, man. And, and I just, my work ethic from basketball, I, it, it was well known that I was a workaholic, but, um, it's funny how it transitions over to this too. So it, it never really stops. Can I ask you and one I, more, one more question? I need to get your address before, before you hang up with me. Yeah. Can I get, that's one, I've, I've heard you reference, humility that you've learned, I guess maybe both, not just on the court, but off is it, can I, can we, can we explore that for a second? Yep. Cause I'm, cause I mean, you, you know, you were, you know, the, the surface level view of you as a player, fair or not, pro probably unfair was kind of, okay, kind of a hothead. I'm interested to, interested to hear your perspective on that and, and sort of the humility. Yeah. You know, I look back at it, um, I wish I would have been more compassionate to my teammates as far as, you know, Ron Bradley, I talked to him one time. He's like, you know, you need to realize like some of these guys aren't, aren't given the same level of like go get itness as you were growing up. And a lot of them, what they see is, man, you drive a nice car. You have both parents, your dad mm -hmm. comes to every game. Um, I, I I was so single and one track minded that I didn't register that, that those things. Self-awareness. Self-awareness. I, I, it was, and to be honest with you, Brother Williams, like, I don't know for a fact that I would have been successful if I would have been as compassionate. Mm, that's interesting. Uh, because I couldn't afford to focus on anybody else than what I was doing. Because it's it's really hard to explain. Like if I wasn't, yeah, I was so goal oriented. Like that's what I wanted to do so bad that I would I would almost kill somebody for it. And and as a result, that took away from me being having the ability to be compassionate for other people's feelings, other people's growing up situations, things of that nature. Like. I wish I would have been a little bit more understanding of why people the way are the way they are. And, and I've been able to, you know, I played in the Republic of Georgia to where I stayed in a one, one bedroom and, uh, with my wife and there were rats in the walls and they cut our water off for two weeks at a time. And I never really 
those are things that I never really had to worry about. And, and, and like, because I was always so focused on what was next. I never took it. I never took time to kind of understand like why people are the way they are, why people would be upset at, for one reason or another. Um, because I was so one track minded. Uh, one thing that, that Europe did teach me is I needed to be, I needed to be more understanding of what people go through. I need to be more understanding of, of why things are the way they are. And so it was a growing up process. And then everything that happened to me was a result of my own doing. And there was no way of getting out of it. And there was, there was a no, there was no immediate forgiveness because I was going to shoot 42% as far as like starting a fight in practice or, or I, you know what? I'm not going to say start a fight in practice. I'm going to say defend myself from practice, but I was a lot quicker to hit back than most people. <laughs> uh, but you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, I think, uh, you say humble. I'm not sure that I wasn't humble. I, I it was more so, uh, what's the right word? It's it, it, driven. And I'm not comparing myself to people of this caliber of who I'm going to speak of, but like Kobe Bryant hurt a lot of people's feelings, but he was driven. Michael Jordan hurt a lot more people's feelings, but he was driven. I wasn't as good as those guys, but I would argue that I was just as driven. Mm -hmm. And in the business I was in, I mean, look at, look at, how I measure up. I mean, I was sick. I was listed at six, two, 185 pounds and I was being guarded by six, six, two, 15, six, six, two, 20 all night. If I wasn't a little mean and a little like that, like Tanner Smith was going to take my job. Mm -hmm. If I wasn't mean, like he was going to take my job. If, if, if I wasn't mean, David Potter was going to, uh, basically do whatever he wanted with me because like he was so big and so tall and so skilled, but mentally, I, I was much tougher than David. And because of that, I sacrificed a lot. And my failures as a professional kind of led me to be a little bit more introspective as far as like what I could have done differently. So as I've grown up and as I've gotten older, I'm starting to realize like my kids have it really good. And my dad worked his butt off to where I had it really good, but I never really thought about it because as, as we grew up, like we grew up when I was young, when dad first came back, like he was laying asphalt when we first got back and then he got a job with a pharmaceutical place. And then one thing led to another. So he didn't really start seeing success until he was, until I was in high school. Like I'm talking very good success because he, he improved fairly quickly, but I saw the process of what needed to be done in order to be successful. And I think I sacrificed a lot of uh, sentiment and I sacrificed a lot of um, basically friendships at the time because I was driven and I hate that because like me and Tanner Smith should be great friends and we're, we're friends today we talk on the phone and, and uh, on occasion and things like that but we should have been great friends me and Dave me and Zay Anderson should have been great friends and we're just not and uh, you know there's Part of that is it's it's a lot of my own doing, but at the same time, like would I have an opportunity to to work games now? If I was a nice guy then, I would almost venture to say no because I wouldn't have been as productive. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. So I, you know, I just I, I do feel there's times where I feel bad, Larry. Like I, I I sit back and like I wish I could, you know call certain guys like you know thank god like zay anderson such a sweet person who's work he's working down at bmi like i've called him and talked to him and 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 th those guys all knew like when i was off the court man i was i was a good guy most of the time except for one time on the lake but like <laughs> uh, like <laughs> I, I think uh you know I, I think the ability to be compassionate was not at the forefront of my mind when i was 20 years old because i was so driven and boy, is that different now with teams, uh, with mm -hmm. what with what happened last summer, with what happened two weeks ago. Somebody on the basketball staff, you might be aware of this, you probably are, but somebody on the basketball staff told me that the, what happened to the Capitol, like that was a major gut punch to a lot of players on that current team. Like somebody said, it was just as powerful and damaging 
as that that uh, as that knee on George Floyd's neck to see like people literally being you know people literally trying to uh, kidnap <laughs> and yeah. possibly even kill our elected leaders. I'm not sure if the average fan or the average person really thinks about that. Like what you know what this has been like inside the walls of of, of teams that are that are that are you know people from all different cultures and different lots in life uh mm-hmm. it, it, there's a lot more awareness now i guess i'm saying of, of of your fellow of your brother on on your team than there was maybe before yeah well there's no distractions right now i, I think like it, it, because of people have been locked up and people are angry and we it's it's i'm not going to get political sure. uh, that's not, that's not that people don't want to hear me talk politics um, but I think the fact that people aren't working right now, and obviously the situation with the pandemic is what it is. I think on top of that, people, um, these, these student athletes don't have a break. Like they, they, they can't just go off and, and hang out with other people. Like they're, they're stuck with just those guys. So for them to be able, it's almost like a safe bubble for them to be able to express their feelings and, and, and things of that nature, which for them to be able to talk through things, it, it, not just those problems, but problems, um, you know, for the average person to go have, have the ability to go talk to somebody, I think is definitely a good thing. Anything we haven't covered that, that, uh, that I missed. Oh man. I, I think we got about, about all of it, Larry. I, besides, uh, let's see. No, I think that's got it. That's got it. I just need to make sure I get your address before you hang up with me. Absolutely. Well, we're going to have you back on, man. Your your uh, your your arrow is pointed up professionally, and so I, I can't wait to see the the places you're going to go. And um, would love to have you as a regular guest moving forward as you as you make that climb. Thank you, yeah, Terrence. You, you just let me know. You just let me know. I appreciate you so much for having me on. All right, Terrence Oglesby. I am not right on all of my predictions. But I feel pretty confident in saying that dude is going to do big things as a as a radio slash TV color analyst for basketball. He is better than a lot of the folks out there already. So thanks to old T.O. for sharing his time with us. Thanks to all of you for listening. Really appreciate the support of our seven sponsors. Could not do it without them. Everybody have a wonderful and safe weekend. We'll see you next week. Cheers.